Even with these victories, Marlin realized that his power as governor was limited and state law prohibited him from running for a second consecutive term. He set his sights on an open U.S. Senate seat. As a congressman, E.W. had made rich and powerful enemies. They poured money into his opponent's campaign. In 1936, he was defeated in a runoff. He lost again two years later. In the face of these defeats, Marlin still had a gracious spirit, even with Josh Lee, his opponent in the 1936 Senate race. And he lived in uh, the artist quarters and was reclining on the sofa. He wasn't feeling well. And he got up and had his hand on his side and, and walked with slow steps over and stuck out his hand and said, Senator, I'm so glad to see you. It's wonderful to have you come and see me. And I thought I've never seen such dignity uh, in my life as uh, that man showed. The mansion remained empty for 12 years. Marlin couldn't afford to pay back taxes. His longtime friend, Bill McFadden, paid the debt and gave Marlin the deed. Even so, Marlin couldn't afford to maintain the mansion and reluctantly decided to sell. A Catholic order of Carmelite monks bought the mansion for $66,000, about two cents on the dollar. Marlin's health worsened. After two small strokes, he couldn't speak. On October 3rd, 1941, Marlin died in the chauffeur's cottage at the age of 67 with Lighty at his side. Soon after E.W.'s funeral, George and his family moved to Tulsa to start over. For the first time, Lady Roberts Marlin was alone. At the age of 41, she was youthful looking, but adrift, unaccustomed to making her own way without E.W. She stayed on in Ponca City for 12 years, struggling to find her own identity and place in the community. She said, you know, when E.W. died, I was never invited to another ladies club. She knew her friends were her friends because of her name. And I think at, at that point in her life, watching everything crumble before her, she had at her age in her mind only two things to do, fight or flight. And my opinion is she chose flight. Finally, local gossip and a failed romance with a humiliating public breakup convinced Lighty to leave for good in 1953. She had poor eyesight and no driver's license. She would disappear for 22 years. Her brother never stopped looking for her. Fearing foul play, George filed a missing person report with the FBI, but they couldn't provide any leads. George died four years later without knowing his sister's fate. In 1958, a lurid Saturday Evening Post article asked, where is Lady Marlin? She told us that uh, she marched in the resistant movement while she was gone, that she stood in soup lines, and that she was in California, New York, Washington, and other places. Lady didn't break all ties to Ponca City. She continued to pay property taxes on her cottage beside the mansion, but the cottage was falling apart. Mrs. Blackard one day told me that Lighty's cottage was in disrepair, that vines were going through the tile roof and uh, wanted me to find her. And I asked her, how do you think I can find her when she's been gone for 20 some years? And she said, well, you're a lawyer, aren't you? After years of trying, Northcutt finally established contact. Her letters revealed the pain of her self-imposed exile. 
It has been a nightmare, breaking me down physically in every way. I was never a missing person. I spent years trying to evade the relentless surveillance and never succeeding. Finally, in 1975, with Northcutt's gentle encouragement, Lydie was ready to come home. I got a call one day from Bartlesville. Uh, she said, I'm in room 38 of the Green Door Inn in Bartlesville. I said, Lydie, I'll be there in an hour and a half. But when I got to the Green Door Inn, the door was open. And I walked in, and there's nobody there. And I said, Lydie, are you here? And she came out of the bathroom. First time I'd seen her. Iron gray hair, wrinkled, and, but still she had a presence. And she stuck out her hand. I said, no, Lydie. Welcome home. Lydie moved into the chauffeur's quarters, renamed Lydie's Cottage. Although she remained a very private person, she did open up to a few close friends. As far as we knew, she was very bright, and she could talk about anything you want to talk to her about. In the nine plus years I was with her, she was in control. She wanted to be in control of her life, no matter how good or bad it was. Even decades after E.W.'s death, the media still pursued her. I've seen her one time. We talked only briefly, but long enough to convince me that she's still pretty much the same kind of person that she was more than a quarter century ago. Very private, wanting to be left alone, and above all, not wanting to talk about the past. Gregory just came onto the property and, and uh, went up and tried to interview her. So it was an invasion of privacy is what it amounted to. When a Tulsa newspaper reporter wouldn't stop following her, she reached a breaking point. She had told me that uh, she had these suitcases full of memorabilia, but after that experience, she destroyed all of them. They're lost. <laughs> 